Hi, my name is Daniel Chan from Thomas Jefferson High School for Science and Technology, Virginia. Hi, my name is Alan Chan. I'm from Irvington High School in Fremont, California. Hi, my name is Sarath Bamakanti, and I'm from Amador Valley High School in California. The title of our project is a novel study on the effects of surface topography of 3D printed polylactic acid scaffolds on dental pulp stem cell proliferation and differentiation in vitro. Currently, there's an increased demand for dental implants that are cost efficient and tailored to specific patients. Figure one on the right shows an image of an implant that is ridden with many problems. Some of these problems include high production costs, potential transplant rejection, and post-surgical irritations. DPSCs have a very high potential for tissue and bone regeneration. Naturally, they differentiate into odontoblasts, which are known for growth of teeth and regeneration. In addition, their potential for regeneration outside of the tooth is vast, as they are multipotent and capable of differentiating into osteocytes, adipocytes, and chondrocytes, and are much more easily accessible compared to other types of stem cells as shown in Figure 2. DPSCs also have a very low morbidity rate, as they interact with their biomaterials and have the capability to avoid many ethical violations that come along with using stem cells. Dexamethasone is a type of glutocorticoid that is known to induce osteogenic differentiation. Previous studies have shown that the use of dexamethasone in coordination with dental pulp stem cells creates the formulation of nodules, which are early signs of differentiation. Our sp study specifically focuses on the conjunction between 3D printers and dental pulp stem cells. The polymer that we chose for our 3D printer was PLA. PLA is a biodegradable polymer that has been approved by the FDA for use in medical applications. PLA is a highly, highly, highly cost-effective and highly customizable polymer that has been approved by the FDA for use in medical application and is much and it also, for our expectation, we use spun cast scaffolds as equivalent to ideal molded scaffolds, as both spun cast scaffolds and ideal molded scaffolds are completely flat and have identical surface topographies. As a result, the FDA has been trying to give 510K pre-market approval to 3D printed structures, which states that the device at hand or 3D printed structures are substantially equivalent to the legally marketed device or molded scaffolds, which have been approved by the FDA for use in medical application as well. In order to test for this, we use a reproducibility test in which we created structures of, from two, two separate 3D printers with identical, identical surface topographies and wanted to see whether they truly did have identical surface topographies. We also wanted to see whether 3D printed structures or spun cast scaffolds would have higher levels of proliferation or differentiation in vitro. Our two main objectives were to assess 510K approval and to assess proliferation and differentiation on 3D printed scaffolds. Some of the significances were the implication of more effective bone implants and experimentation without dexamethasone, as previous studies have all shown the use of dexamethasone in their, in their studies, making our project novel. Our two main hypotheses were that 3D printed scaffolds would show higher levels of osteogenic differentiation than spun cast scaffolds, which are equivalent to ideal molded, and that surface topographies would in fact increase osteogenic differentiation. The cells that we use for the study is the AV3 EGFP cell line. EGFP stands for enhanced green fluorescent protein. So these cells have been genetically modified to produce enhanced green fluorescent protein. So the cells light up green under the microscope. We received the cells from Stony Green University with 70 to 80 percent confluence in a T75 flask. So we had to detach the cells from the surface of the flask using a trypsinization process, which we neutralized with alpha MEM, which has fetal bovine serum. In the lab, we have two separate 3D printers. We named these two printers 230P and 215P. And you can see what they look like in figures four and five. The main difference between these two printers is the extrusion temperature. The extrusion temperature for 230p is at 230 degrees Celsius, and for 215p it's at 215 degrees Celsius. All 3D printed structures are printed at 10% infill standard resolution with PLA filaments, and before plating any of the cells onto the surface of these 3D printed structures, we sterilize them with ethylene oxide treatment, which was done for us by Stony Brook University. Our project is divided into two parts. The first part is the comparison of the 3D printers. We do this by creating 15 samples from each of the printers, rectangular samples with dimensions 10 millimeter by 30 millimeter by 2 millimeter, and plating at a cell density of 12,000 cells per centimeter squared. Starting from day one, every other day, we replace the media and also image the samples under the fluorescent microscope. On day five, we conducted analysis on the scanning electron microscope, which tells us the surface topography of our samples, and on the electron dispersive X-ray spectrometer to see the surface composition of our samples. On day 42, we conducted analysis on the confocal microscope to see the biomineralization level of our cells. Now, the second part of our project was the comparison of the 3D printed structure and the spun cast structure. We do this by creating 20 of the same rectangular samples for the 3D printed structure, and we also create 20 spun cast structures. We do this by taking 100 silicon wafers, and if you put drops of PLA on top and spin it at a high velocity on the photoresist spinner, then it perfectly distributes the PLA on top of the silicon wafer. That's completely flat. This time around, we play at a cell density of 9,000 cells per centimeter squared. And same as in part one, starting from day one, every other day, we replace the media and also image the samples under the fluorescent microscope. On day three, we did the same thing with SCM and EDAX to see the surface topography and the surface composition of our samples. And on day five, we actually introduced a positive control by taking half of the samples and putting dexamethasone into the media of the cells to see how the cells would react. And we also introduced a shaking stimulus 
by taking half of the samples that were treated with dexamethasone, half of the samples that were not treated with dexamethasone, and incubating them on a rocking shaker to simulate an in vivo fluid motion of the body. On day 39, we did the same thing with confocal microscope to see the biomineralization levels of our cells. And for this part only, we also, conducted the R we also isolated the RNA and conducted RT-PCR to see the uh, relative expression levels of osteogenic markers. We do this by lysing the cell with triazole and then purifying the content with creatine RNA easy mini kit. And with RT-PCR, we look at four osteogenic markers. Two early markers, ALP and RUNX2, and two late markers, OCN and Cal1A1. And you can see the four inverse primers in this table one right here. And we also use 18S RNA as a reference gene for RT-PCR. And you can also see the reverse, four inverse primers in that as well. So we look at the first set of results where we compare the two printers. Here you see the SEM images. On the left is the 230P. And you can see that the filaments are very well fused there are no holes. But for the 215P, the filaments are not well fused. And there seem to be a lot of holes. This is best explained by the extrusion temperature, because the extrusion temperature for 215p was lower and was probably not high enough for the filaments to be melted enough to the point of the layers comfortably fusing into one uh, fluent layer like in 230p. Next, we look at the, the fluorescent images. On the left is a 230p. On the right is a 215p. Row one is day one after cell plating. And you can see that there are just more cells on 230p than on the 215p. And as we let the cells grow, the green signal is much stronger on the 230p than on the 250p, telling us that there is more proliferation on 230p. Next, we look at the biomineralization levels. This is the SEM image right before confocal micro microscopy, and it just confirms that there are cells sitting on our surface. This is the EDAX graph, and since there are peaks of phosphorus and calcium for both cases, it tells us that there's some level of biomineralization and calcification on our cells. And the confocal microscope on the right tells us that there's more biomineralization on 230p than on 215p, as indicated by the strong red region right there on the top image. From those results, we decided on using the 230p printer to proceed in our experiment to compare our Splencast scaffolds with our 3D printed PLA scaffolds. So here you can see the difference between the surface topographies of both scaffolds. The 3D printed scaffold is on the left and is much more rough in comparison to our Splencast scaffolds. After 24 hours of cell growth, we used fluorescent microscopy to check our cell scaffolds, and we actually found that there are similar levels of cell adhesion for both scaffolds. As you can see, the cell adhesion for the left, which is the 3D printed scaffold, is similar to the cell adhesion on the right, which is the spun cast scaffold. After seven days of cell growth, we again used fluorescent microscopy to check our scaffolds, and we actually found that there is nodules for forming in many of our samples, which indicates an early sign of osteogenic differentiation. So as you can see, the first row on top shows all samples that are created with our 3D printer, whereas the bottom row shows all samples that are created with our spun cast method. The first column to the left shows all samples that are treated without dexamethasone, and you can see there is only nodule formation on top with the 3D printed scaffold. As we move on to the middle column, there's only there's nodule formation on both scaffolds with, uh, treated with dexamethasone, which is in line with previous research. Lastly, the third column shows results for scaffolds that are plated with the rocking shaker and without dexamethasone. And you can see that there's an increase in the proliferation rate of the cells. After uh, 39 days of cell growth, we use confocal microscopy to check for the biomineralization of our cells. And the red circles in each of the figures actually highlight the areas in which the biomineralization is shown in red. As you can see in figures A and C, there's more biomineralization bio for our 3D printed scaffolds without shaking stimulus and without dexamethasone as compared to their spun cast counterparts. This remains true for the rest of the comparisons. At the end of 39 days, we also used RT-PCR to measure the relative mRNA levels for both G uh, for all of our osteogenic marker genes. First, we tested our early marker genes, ALP, alkaline phosphatase, and RUNX2, run-related transcription factor 2. As you can see in the first two bars of both graphs, there is more MR relative mRNA expression for these genes for our 3D printed scaffolds without dexamethasone and without shaking stimulus as compared to our spun cast scaffolds. As we move on to our late markers, you can see with OCN, osteocalcin, and Col1A1, alpha-1 type 1 collagen, in the fifth and sixth bars for both graphs, there is more expression for our 3D printed scaffolds without dexamethasone and with shaking stimulus. And this remains true for other comparisons as well. So with these results, we can first see that 3D printers that create the same scaffold, that different 3D printers that create the same scaffold actually create different surface topographies as shown in our SEM. 
We also know that 3D printed PLA scaffolds cause a high, same level of, similar level of cell proliferation as well as a higher level of osteogenic differentiation when compared to our spun cast scaffolds. Third of all, we also know that dexamethasone is actually not required to induce osteogenic differentiation in our 3D printed PLA scaffolds of, the, of DPSEs. Lastly, we know that our shaking stimulus that we introduced to simulate in vivo motion actually increases the proliferation rate of our DPSCs. In summary, we can conclude that our 3D printed PLA scaffolds increase the osteodifferentiation capabilities of our uh, stem cells. This could be vital in the creation of a new cost-effective solution to bone implants that can be tailor-made to each patient. Our use of dexamethasone and spun cast scaffolds as a positive and negative control respectively validates our results. Our results also indicated that 510K should not be given to our 3D printed PLA scaffolds as it is vastly different from our, uh, the current market implementation which is represented by the spun cast scaffold. Future studies could look into the use of, three, uh, of phase separation of polymethyl methacrylate and polystyrene so we can create an optimal roughness that can induce more differentiation. We can also use human serum instead of fetal bovine serum so we can remove the use of xenogenic material and therefore the chance of zoonosis. We'd like to thank the fa faculty and facilities at Stony Brook University for having us and helping us along with our project. We'd also like to thank the Siemens Foundation, Discovery Education, and George Washington University for having us. Thank you very much.